Have you ever felt that your internet's playing tricks on you? Like someone's peeking over your shoulder whenever you go online? Well, that's when today's fantastic sponsor, Surfshark, comes in. With Surfshark, you can finally keep your online activity private without breaking the bank. Look. I used to worry about it, everyone worries about it, people snooping on your internet activities, but Surfshark makes everything you or I do online safe and secure. And you know those annoying geo blocks? Well, Surfshark blasts right through those. No more missing out on your favorite shows or deals just because of your location. Plus, when I'm traveling, I can still access content from back home. It's like having a piece of home wherever I go. Integrating Surfshark into my routine was a breeze. It's easy to use, and it just fits seamlessly into your online life. Whether you're on your computer or your phone, wherever you are, it's there. Plus, if you use the promo code ITS, you'll get an extra three months for free. All you need to do is go to surfshark.deals forward slash ITS. Your internet experience will never be the same again. Big thank you to Surfshark, and now back to today's video. The United States' oldest enemy is the British Empire. This statement is usually made in jest since the two nations have been close allies for over a century, but it wasn't always that way. Of course, there was the American Revolution, followed by the War of 1812, both of which pitted the US against England, but tensions remained high between the two countries for a long time after that. Most of the tensions revolved around the US-Canadian border, as Canada was still under British control at the time, but these were barely minor in scope. These disputes often centered around things like who had the right to cut down trees near a border. In age 59, a Canadian pig was shot while foraging for potatoes across the border in an American's garden. The pig war resulted in the British and American troops squaring off against one another, with the Americans outnumbered four to one. Fortunately, the dispute was resolved after Royal Navy Rear Admiral Robert Baines refused the order to engage the Americans, stating, to engage two great nations in a war over a squabble about a pig would be foolish. Although cooler heads prevailed and armed conflict between the nations was avoided, it wasn't until decades later, when the US helped arbitrate land disputes in Venezuela, that the nations started becoming allies. It was also helped that they saw a common enemy in the Germans, and the alliance between the Americans and the British only strengthened following World War I. However, although the two countries were now on friendly terms, both recognized that there was still the possibility that they could go to war. Canada, which was still a British territory at the time, despite being self-governing, recognized this first. In 1921, Lieutenant Colonel James Buster Sutherland Brown, the Canadian Director of Military Operations Intelligence, drew up Defense Scheme No. 1, a plan to invade the United States in case armed conflict arose between them and the British Empire. In 1927, the United States developed its own plan, known as War Plan Red. This was one of many color-coded war plans that the US military devised for potential wars with other nations. War Plan Yellow dealt with China, War Plan Brown dealt with an uprising in the Philippines, which was under US military rule at the time, and War Plan Orange was a plan for war with Japan. Of these plans, War Plan Orange is the most well known, as many of the tactics devised for a war against Japan were utilized during World War II, such as a naval blockade to cut off trade with mainland China and putting Japanese Americans in internment camps. Always wanting to be prepared, the United States War Plan Red was created as a plan in the event of war with the British. This plan was further subdivided depending on where within the British Empire the fighting might take place. There was Ruby for India, Scarlet for Australia, and Garnet for New Zealand. But today, we're going to be looking at the most famous aspect of War Plan Red, Crimson, the plan to defeat the British Empire with a US invasion of Canada. Of course, this raises the questions of what exactly were these two plans, and why did both sides think that an invasion might be necessary? To start, creating hypothetical plans like these is routine. Global politics can be unpredictable, and countries like to have some sort of plan on the books in case the improbable or unexpected transpires. The US military famously even has a plan of action drawn up in case a zombie apocalypse ever breaks out. But beyond being a routine precaution, there were genuine reasons that both nations believed going to war with each other was a possibility, even if it was unlikely. The British Royal Navy had long ruled the seas, and with the defeat of Germany in World War I, their greatest rival for maritime supremacy was left devastated. However, the United States had demonstrated its Navy's power during the war, and the rapid industrialization of the US, combined with its abundant resources, such as the iron ore and coal necessary to make steel, allowed them to increase their military's might considerably. The Washington Naval Conference of 1921 to 1922 was a major turning point in this. While the treaty put limits on the size and number of warships that the signing nations could build, it was also a de facto acknowledgement by the British that the US were their peers in naval might. And this was where the problem lied, as British naval superiority was essential to protecting themselves on the world stage. Of course, 
While the British believed that a war with the US was a remote possibility, they believed it was only going to come about by accident. They certainly had no desire to start a war. However, the British exercised what they called belligerent rights during times of conflict. These rights were supposed to be based in international law, but the agreement granting these rights was never ratified, and thus England was on rather shaky legal ground. Regardless, under these belligerent rights, the British claimed the authority to impede trade with a nation whom they were at war with. Using the might of the Royal Navy to weaken enemies was a key strategy for any British military engagement, so they would either block trade routes entirely or seize goods being transported on merchant ships. This created diplomatic problems on numerous occasions, including with the United States. Before entering the war, the US engaged in trade with both Allied and Central Powers, though the British blockade sought to prevent this trade and seize goods being shipped to Central Powers. If a future conflict were to break out between the British Empire and a country that was a trading power with the United States, the British would have no choice but to attempt to block trade again. As we said, this was a key aspect to all their military strategies. However, with the US Navy now rivaling the Royal Navy, there were fears that the US might provide military escorts for merchant ships in an attempt to force their trade through the blockades. While higher-ups in the British military hoped that their ranks would all have the sense not to engage the US Navy, open defiance of their belligerent rights could be met with force, thus accidentally sending the two friendly nations into war. This was the main concern from the British side, but the United States had a couple of additional concerns. America was a highly industrialized nation, abundant with natural resources. This greatly increased their prosperity and made them major players in global commerce. But historically, the British hadn't taken things like that lying down. The British Empire was known to use its navy to protect its commercial dominance, and the United States' growing wealth and commercial influence could be seen as a threat to their spot as the top economic power in the world. Though the US also believed that war with the British was unlikely, they feared it would be an international act of aggression by the British rather than an accident. Not only was the US threatening to overtake the British Empire in terms of wealth, might, and global importance, but they also wanted their money back. Following World War I, England owed the US $22 billion, that's about half a trillion dollars today, and they weren't gonna let that slide. For the most part, anyway. The $22 billion figure was based on a 62 installment payment plan at 5% interest. The interest was eventually negotiated down to 3%, and the principal was slightly reduced, but overall, the US was very insistent about getting their money back. So insistent, in fact, that they kept demanding payments until the full balance was finally paid off in 2006. But this hardline stance on getting paid was another fact that the US thought might incentivize the British to wage war against them. Although any potential conflict could be avoided through diplomacy, both sides saw very realistic scenarios that could result in war. Canada was still part of the British Empire, and as such, Lieutenant Colonel Buster Brown was of the belief that a war between the US and the British would likely begin with Canada. Although the plan called for an invasion of the United States, it was named Defense Scheme No. 1 because it was a very much defensive plan. Canada's military didn't stand a chance against the United States, and they knew it. There had been global demobilization of troops following World War I, and by the time this plan was drawn up, Canada's military only had a few thousand members in active duty. Calling up all the reserves, a process which could take months, would increase their numbers to 350,000 or so. By contrast, the US Army still had over 130,000 active duty soldiers, and the US Navy had another 100,000 active personnel. During the war, the United States had over 4 million members in active duty. For such a small force to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with such a large force in conventional warfare, they would have needed some sort of massive technological advantage that Canada simply didn't possess. With all that in mind, Canada's plan to invade the US wasn't designed to conquer. It was just a delay tactic until reinforcements that would number in the millions could arrive from all around the British Empire. Brown believed that the United States' first order of business would be to take control of Montreal and Ottawa, followed by Hamilton, Toronto, and Vancouver. Under Brown's plan, the day the war broke out, the Canadian military would immediately launch a counteroffensive onto US soil. They would send flying columns of troops to the south to take control of Seattle, Fargo, Great Falls, Minneapolis, and Albany. They were to hold the areas as long as possible to distract American forces and then retreat back to Canada, destroying bridges and infrastructure as they did so. It certainly had potential as the initial stages of a military engagement, but this was the extent of the plan. Again, though, Brown was relying on the more numerous British reinforcements to take care of the Americans, so a way to stall them out was all that was deemed necessary. 
Despite being a seemingly incomplete invasion plan, there were supporters within the Canadian military. Major General George Parks endorsed the plan by essentially saying that it was so crazy that it might just work. While Defense Scheme No. 1 stayed on the books for seven years, it was terminated in 1928, and the Chief of the General Staff ordered all copies of the document to be destroyed. And that was for the best, as some historians have referred to Brown's plan as being suicidal. There are two main reasons for that. One of them being that Brown failed to identify what the United States' real targets would be. Brown had successfully identified some of the cities the United States would target in the event of an invasion such as Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal. But those cities would not be the first stops. First, they would seize control of the Canadian power plants near Niagara Falls, cutting off the power. Though coal plants were in use across Canada and many rural communities simply didn't have electricity yet, the hydroelectric plants at Niagara Falls were one of the most important sources of power in Canada, especially in Ontario. Their other primary goal was to seize the port city of Halifax. This was the most important part of the plan because the US predicted that the British Empire could summon 14 battleships and 5 aircraft carriers to the port within just 40 days of war breaking out. But if the Americans controlled Halifax, there wouldn't be a suitable base of naval operations for the British, preventing them from providing Canada with troops and supplies. Once these two objectives were completed, the US would launch a full-scale invasion of Canada, seizing control of every major city as well as any ports that the British could use to resupply Canada. The plan was originally drafted in 1927 and approved in 1930, and it continued to receive updates until World War II broke out. Revised plans went so far as to specify which individual roads the military should send its columns of armored vehicles along to best invade the designated cities. There were also extensive war games to prepare for War Plan Red, reportedly involving 36,000 soldiers. Though the US was confident that their plan would be successful, they knew that a full-scale conflict with the British Empire would not be an easy win. However, there was one major potential flaw with the plan. The Crimson variant of War Plan Red was reliant on being able to use Canada as leverage against the British Empire. Because they had near limitless authority to self-govern, there was the possibility that the Dominion of Canada would declare the neutrality if war broke out between the US and England. Such an action would render the entire plan pointless, though the plan did state that if this were to happen, the US should not accept their declaration of neutrality without being able to first occupy Halifax and other important ports. Now, fortunately, Canada and the United States did not try to invade one another since neither wanted to go to war in the first place. This is especially fortunate for Canada because they would not have any part to victory. We mentioned that Brown's defense scheme number one was deemed suicidal by historians in part because he failed to recognize the importance of Halifax or Niagara Falls. The Canadian plan was fully dependent on receiving aid from the British Empire, yet they had taken no precautions to prevent the US troops from cutting off that aid. But there was another, much more important flaw with his plan. He never coordinated his plan with the British, and had he tried to do so, he would have learned that they had no intention of coming to help. And why would they? If the British military and the United States military were believed to be of relatively equal strength, trying to wage war in North America would naturally favor the United States. Their entire military was already there. Based on memos from British generals at the time, it is believed that if the two nations did go to war, they would have written off Canada entirely and focused their efforts elsewhere. They never drew up a formal plan of attack like the US or Canada did, so it's difficult to say how the British would have conducted such a war, but all evidence suggests they weren't interested in fighting on America's home turf. Not only was distance an issue, but the US Navy could have used England's military tactic of choice against them. With the United Kingdom being so tiny compared to the US and their navies being at parity, it would have been far easier for the US to block trade to the United Kingdom than for the Royal Navy to block trade to both coasts of the United States. Even if the British could successfully blockade the US, doing so would require so much of their naval fleet that it would have left their other territories difficult to defend. Ultimately, World War II rendered all of these plans irrelevant as the United States and England became stronger allies, but it remains a stark reminder that when it comes to global politics, even your closest allies are always plotting how to kill you. They may even have tens of thousands of troops rehearsing those plans right now, just in case we're watching you, America.